I've been pastoring for 47 years. In the beginning of that pastorate, when I was going to Western, I would get on my knees. I would beg people to come, and they would. I would beg them to pray. The hardest thing that I've found in, in all of in Christian circles, no matter what church, is to get people on their knees, to get them to talk to God. They're real interested in what they want to do, and many times when I would go to God, I would realize that there were people that were just, you know, we, we could ask them to come and hear a sermon. They would. But when I'd ask them to get on their knees and pray, they would not. That's talking to your Creator. And when we were in line with each other, one, one or two people came into the room. And I want you know, it's a, it's a shame that we live in an hour where there is no revival in the houses of God. There's plenty of crowds, but that doesn't mean that they're a success. And there's a lot of people that believe that what they have ministry-wise is, is a success because they can gather a crowd. But if they ever said to them, well, let's, let's do this. Wednesday night we're going to get together and we're not going to preach to you, but we're going to pray. We're going to ask God uh, to move and change cities and change families and, and change the hearts of people because people are so hardened these days. They don't, they're not interested in God. They're interested in their thing and they want God to come along and approve of what they're doing. It's doing their thing in God's name. It's not doing God's thing. As I said in pre-service, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And until we spend time in His presence, we don't know God. We know about Him. We can have some intellectual assent toward Him. I heard a message one time, a long time ago, that was this, Is God an end or is He a means? If he's everything to you, then he is the beginning and the end. But if he is a means, then it's just you go to God to get what you want, and you ask him to make you happy and all of that kind of thing. And that, but let me, let me tell you what happened. You know I'm a psychologist, and you know that, I mean, they taught me, you know, Skinner, Freud, and Sigmund Freud did more damage to the body of Christ than anybody that I've ever known. Because what he tried to do is figure out why humans do things. And at the end of that, he began to postulate a doctrine that got into the church. Now, I, I'm not telling you psychology is wrong. I'm telling you to, to change, because that's all about humans. But the psychology of God is a completely different thing. When God gets into your head and into your heart, you begin to see things differently than you ever did. And He changes who you are. You become a new creature. There's a lot of people that believe they're born again because they go to churches every week and that they study things and they believe they can, they, and they can say the right things and stuff. But listen to me. If you're not spending time in the presence of the Lord, if you're not praying, if you're not seeking His ways, then you don't know Him. And you can go to church all week and still not know Him. But listen to me. I'm not, I'm not against people having boxes and churches and stuff. And listen, what I am against is, is I'm against men of God that want to make people feel okay in their condition and then those people die and go to a godless hell. Because they felt like, well, I went to church and I did my duty. And there's a lot of people around the world that do that just to keep the boxes open. they got to pay the bills. And if that's why they're doing what they did, I'll go on and go back to Judges 17 and 18 and find out what happened when Micah had a Levite come to his house. Think about this. The Levite was hired and he was going to be given ten shekels of silver per year. By the way, nobody in this room would work for 10 shekels of silver per year. Even in that day, it was about $100 American. 
would you work for $100 for a whole year? And a change of clothes, which was like a, it's a gabera. It, it's, the, it's like a large shirt that goes down to your feet. And he agreed to be a Levite and a priest in the house of Micah for $100 a year and, uh, and a change of clothing. Do you know, how does that apply to today? There's a lot of people that are standing in pulpits around our world that will not stand in a pulpit. I have them all the time. It's like, can I come to your church and that kind of thing? I'll come and, you know, it costs you about $3,000, but I'll come. And I'm going, you won't come here. If that's what you do, what you do for, and, you know, if that's what you're doing it for, you will never darken this door when you can be a hireling like the one that walked into Micah's house. By the way, when the children of Israel showed up at the door of Micah and found out there was a Levite that was living there, had built a little little small temple and put all the things in it, including idols, uh, they took the Levite and put him in the middle of an army of about 500 soldiers. And at the end of that, uh, he was hidden with the, the children of Israel but they said, why are you going to that one or two over there in that house instead of going with us and being a Levite over the whole house of Israel? He was moved by money. So now they told him, guess what? You know, they, you can leave him. You can leave that stuff. We'll come get the stuff. We'll come get the idols and all that stuff, the silver and all that. And we'll bring it into, and so you you don't have to lose what you you've already gained. And they took him, and they took the idolater out. Now this was in a time where people did what they thought was right in the sight of God, but there were no judges, and the prophets were not there, and people everybody was doing what they thought was right. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, if everybody started doing what they thought was right, what if everybody in this room was a murderer? or a whoremonger, or a thief. Then we'd have some real problems in our communities, wouldn't we? What do you think our communities are filled with? People that think what they do is right. But there is only one that can make one right, and he uh, has set for us something that we are to follow. He's our example. And because of that, the Lord began to speak to me and I, about these things. And I wrote some things down. Listen. See, the world thinks that you're successful because you have a large billion-dollar edifice and you've got, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people following you. I've known for a long time that the people that do that kind of thing were not in line with what God was doing. And so I had to leave something like that where there was 13,000 people, 21 pastors on the staff. It was not. It was an entertainment center. It was not God. And the people were oblivious that God wasn't there as long as their emotions were dictated to by the stories and that kind of thing. I don't want somebody's emotions to be bent. I want their spirit to be changed. I don't follow God because I get some sort of a high. I don't follow Him because I can beg Him and ask Him to give me things that I want. Quite frankly, none of those things are in line with God. And many of the doctrines that are coming in our age are false doctrines because they apply themselves to a human condition. This started with Sigmund Freud, but let's go ahead and look at it. Humanism, as defined in the dictionary.com, it says this, any system or mode of thought or action in which human interest, human interest, values and dignity predominate, devotion, to or study of humanities. 
sometimes initial capital letter of the study is principles of culture of the humanist. But look at number four, the philosophy of a variety of ethical theory and practice that emphasizes reason, scientific inquiry, and human fulfillment, human fulfillment. As long as I can be happy. And there's a lot of doctrine preached around God wants you to have your goals obtained and all that. God wants His goals obtained, not yours. He didn't put you here for your purpose. He put you here for His purpose. Listen to this. Emphasizes reason, scientific inquiry, human fulfillment in the natural world and often rejects the importance of a belief in God. What are you watching happening in our world? Almost every program that comes on now has science as its religion. And with it, it tells everyone that, you know, forget God. He, you know, he's over there, don't care about you. There's any, you know, you're not going to get him to come into your situation anyway. You know how they speak about him. But if you start listening to the false prophets of our hour, you'll believe that becoming socially inclined will be what we ought to do as Christians. Christianity takes its name from Jesus Christ who resigned his life to live a life for his Father, which was in heaven. He did nothing unless he asked the Father. If he saw the Father do it, he knew it was okay. If he heard the Father say it, he knew he could say it. But he did not postulate his own beliefs. These were the things that the Father had shown Jesus. And he tells us in John 14, I'm the way. I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. And when he said that, he was changing things. Now, I want to tell you something. I want you to listen to this for a moment. As I was going through Scripture, I just wanted to point out some things that the Bible speaks of. Uh, some 6,000 years ago, there was a man by the name of Noah, and... Uh, do you know what J Noah did? What was his what was his uh, employment? Do you know what that was? Anybody in this room? Don't you tell me he was a shipbuilder. That is not what he was. <laughs> you see, God called Noah to preach to people that there was coming a, a sudden destruction, and if they did not repent, that when that storm came, they would be destroyed. And in that storm, they would be, all of them would be drowned. There would be no life left on the earth except those that were in the ark that God showed him how to build an ark. He was not a shipbuilder. I promise you that. And it took him a hundred years to build that boat. Can you imagine that God had to extend life so that he could build a boat? And let me say this to you. There wouldn't be anybody that was... Um, from a missionary board or, a, or some sort of a denominational board or anything that would have looked in the direction of Noah and said, hey, you're a pretty good preacher. Because in all of that hundred years of preaching, it, he s saw the salvation of his wife, his three sons, and their daughters. That's all. That's a pretty small congregation. Yet, out of all of that, nobody approved of him except his family, which had to, right? You know how that works. Family has to approve of you, right? If they don't, they have heck to pay, right? No, you see, when he was out there, the only one that was approving of Noah was God. All those other people were laughing at him, mocking him. Anytime you bring truth up, wherever the devil exists, he is going to put pressure on the person bringing truth because the truth exposes him. 
exposes a lie. Let's go uh, another couple of hundred years forward after after the the flood and all of that, and we find a man named Jeremiah. Y'all remember Jeremiah? And they called him the weeping prophet. But God did something to Jeremiah. Jeremiah went to him and said, these people won't listen to me. And the Lord says, I'm going to do something to you, Jeremiah. I'm going to make your head as hard as flint. You know anybody that's hard-headed? <laughs> God made his head so hard that he told him, he said, don't even look at the face of those people while you're talking to them. And he preached, and he was some kind of preacher. But you know, none of the prophets of his day, none of the preachers of his day, none of the religions of his day taught him anything. He was rejected by all of those, but he was accepted by God. Do you see a principle here? Let's don't stop there. Let's go a few thousand years forward and let's get on the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus was rejected by all religion. He was rejected by the, uh, by the Pharisees and the scribes of his day. He was rejected by the prophets of his day. He was rejected by most men, but they would follow him as long as he would give them something to eat or heal their diseases, they would follow him. But when he asked something of them, they quit following him. The moment it was going to cost them something, they didn't want to follow him anymore. Jesus had 11 that after three and a half years that were still with him, and I'm pretty sure they weren't real happy about having some, been through some of the things they went through, and then he had 500 that watched him ascend, or at least that's what historically they say. Nevertheless, that's all after three and a half years of preaching and preached to thousands, healed, I mean, thousands and thousands of people of every kind of disease and delivered people from demons, and yet he couldn't get a following that would stick with him. Nevertheless, the Bible speaks that the Father was pleased with him, and he endured all kinds of suffering on behalf of the Father. And because he endured that suffering, the Father was pleased with him. He paid the price for somebody else. He laid down his life for others. Can you imagine preaching 100 years as Noah, uh, or 30-something or years as Jeremiah, and finding yourself you know, rejected by all the people that God sent you to? The Bible plainly speaks to us that a person, when they uh, feel that they're being followed and everything's okay and that kind of thing, it says, beware when all men speak well of you. Beware. That does not mean that God's on your side. As a matter of fact, it might be a distraction in moving in the direction that God wants you to go. Preaching to people is largely not what God sent them to do. He called them to be witnesses before those individuals. Those that would hear him, they were to baptize them and they were to make disciples of them. But those that wouldn't hear them, he said, dust your feet off and go out and, you know, just go. Let the peace return to you. So we talked about that a little bit last week, and I want to I want to kind of pick up there. There's one other person I want to talk to you about. That was y'all remember Peter, you know Simon Peter, you know his name was Cephas, and then Jesus called him Simon Peter, you know, and he was called the Rock, you know that's what Cephas the Rock. Upon this rock I'll build my church. Peter had it in his mind that God was going to build the church on his shoulders. Uh, that was that was a little out there, wasn't it? You see, I'm telling you the truth. See, God doesn't build his church on the backs of any flesh. He built it on the back of Jesus Christ, the rock. And until a person understands that, they're still trying to build his church. You can't build the Lord's church. See, the Lord builds the church in Psalms, it tells us. And those that labor and don't let him do it, and they labor, he says they labor in vain meaning there's emptiness. It does come to nothing. It doesn't matter if you've got 30,000 people in, a, in, in a, an arena that used to be a sports palace. 
it doesn't matter. And I'm not calling names. You know who I'm talking about. But anyway, I wouldn't call the name because the Lord will have to deal with that. There are people, and I know this. I mean, when we had to, we'd sit in that auditorium and we'd watch and flip on the lights and cost you $5,000 for one hour. Electricity for one hour was $5,000. Can you imagine that? And do you know Jesus never had to flip on a switch to cut on the power? He never built not one. He was a carpenter, never built a building, uh, to, uh, to my knowledge, and nothing in Scripture would allude to that, and nothing in the historicals would say anything about Jesus building a church building. He did not. He built people. He called people to leave what they were doing. Listen to me. He didn't tell them you can stay and continue to do what you're doing. He said, come follow me. That meant they had to lay down something. There was a cost involvement in what they did to get what he was offering them. They had to lay something down. As David said, if it doesn't cost me anything, I'm not going to offer that to God, you see. What costs me is what God approves of. Jesus paid with his very own life for all of us to be saved. Nevertheless, it cost him everything. When you come to God, you're coming to God to be changed, not to be a, a new version of a humanist that has to be happy. See, the end of, of all humanism is just that, that I am God, you make me happy and I'll follow you. Listen, those people didn't follow him any further than the day that he said, drink my blood and eat my flesh. And they didn't understand what he was saying, and because they had no understanding, they, all of them, picked up and walked off, and he looked at the disciples and he said to them, hey, will you continue with me, or will you leave me also? And then, you know, Peter. <laughs> Impetuous, first to speak, Last to think, but first to speak. And what he did is he said, you have the words of life. Where would we go? Occasionally, he had a bright idea. I'm more than sure it didn't come from him. Larry, Moe, and Curly, the disciples. Okay, Let's look at a couple of scriptures here together, and then I don't know how far we'll get today. I want to go as far as the Lord wants us to go. But I want you to hear what God's wanting to say to you today. Psalm 50, 23. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. And to him that orders his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of God. So praising God glorifies him. Okay? So when you're singing, it, it isn't supposed to be just you know, mimicking words. You're supposed to be thinking about those words and saying, yes, thank you, thank you. It ought to have a thanks in, from, I mean, from the heart, there ought to be gratitude coming out of us while we're singing, right? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says this, Whether there, uh, therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, everything that you do, eating or drinking, whatever you do, you do all to the glory of God. See, humanism is not the glory of God. It's to make you feel good about where you're at and what you're doing and how you do it. It makes you feel good that you got all these things, and then you sit there in some sort of smug pride, and then God reduces you to nothing because you're in rebellion against Him. But look, He says here, whatever you do, do it, uh, do all to the glory of God. That in which way you live, life can glorify God. Now, how do you glorify God? Everything you do, you do because he's putting it in your heart to do. It's God in us that wills. Remember that. Would you say that with me? It's God in us that wills. So if something comes into your spirit, you know that it wasn't you because you know how you are. But the Holy Spirit puts it inside of you. It's, the, it's God who wills. How, how do you get led by God if you don't listen to him? If I go to the Word of God, I don't want to read the Word of God. Listen to me. I read the Word of God less than anybody in this room. When I go to the Word of God, I sit before that Word and I pray, Lord, reveal yourself to me in your Word. This is your mind concerning us. Lord, reveal yourself to me through your Word. 
Have you ever looked at a page in the Bible and it just came alive? Something just like the letters went into bold print all of a sudden. And then you're looking at it and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit twists through you and shows you something you didn't know about that Scripture. Then you go back and read the other stuff to make sure it's the right Spirit, right? You read the whole thing over again. You know, it, it shouldn't hurt your feelings. You used to do that when you were in school. You know, you'd read a whole paragraph because the teacher taught you to read left to right and then down, right? And then after you read it, you're going, what did I just read? You had to read it again. Y'all did it. You know you know what I mean because you don't have but 4.8 seconds to actually get what you're, whatever you focus on. That's how your brain works. Did you know you were that dense? Well, pick it up. <laughs> Till God gives you a revelation, you're pretty dense, just like those disciples were. All of us in this room have made huge errors in judgment, horrible things that have taken our life in a, in a detour that we probably shouldn't have ever gone down. Amen? Now, Philippians 2, 1 and 11 says this, and, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means the ruler over everything. To the glory of God the Father. Do you see a word in here? To the glory of God the Father. See, you were not created so that you can have fun and manipulate God into doing something for you. You were created by God, for God, for His purpose. And His purpose is to bring glory to His name. What's the cost of that? It, you see, nobody can bring glory to God until their life is laid down. He said a man that lives his life will lose it. But a man that loses his life for the Lord's sake will gain eternal life. Okay? Now, I know that might, might be a little over your head, but I'm asking the Lord to please, Lord, not, not me, but you who gave me these things, reveal it to the minds and the hearts of people so that they don't forget these things. And Holy Spirit, when they start forgetting, bring it back. Okay? Remind them. <clears throat> when you were... Well, anyway. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, uh, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when you repent and trust Christ and confess Him as Lord, it is to the glory of God the Father. When you confess Christ, you're recognizing what God's done, His purpose, how He did it, and why He did it. Now, God didn't do all of that. Now, you may have fun, and you might have moments in your life that are joyful and all that kind of thing. Let me tell you something, but if that's all it is, see, you think that God wants you to have fun, and that's all that He sent Jesus for. In my day coming up, men of God would have called that heresy. Because that was all about humanism. It was about somebody having their way, not God having his way. It was heresy. And when a person has come to a place in their life that they believe that that's what God sent Jesus for, to make them have fun and to prosper them in some kind of a way to distract them from the very means of what God sent them here for, then that person is a heretic. I could give you a hundred scriptures to back that up. But we don't have time. You wouldn't listen to me anyway. First Peter 4, 14 through 16 says, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. What does that mean? Somebody gives you a hard time because you really are a Christian? Because you really want to please God? And when you stand up and you witness against something that isn't, Christ and, and, and you say something and, and it offends somebody. Listen, there is an offense that comes from you. If you stand with God, you're going to offend somebody. The Word of God is an offense to all flesh. If you hadn't read this yet, go over and find it in Romans that Paul says that flesh and blood doesn't inherit. Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom. You find it in Galatians. We read it last week in Galatians chapter 5. All the works of the flesh will not inherit. It's all fun, but it's not going to inherit. And so then he, uh, he contrasted with the very thing that we need. 
which comes from God, because it's the fruit of His Spirit which dwelleth in a man if he is not a reprobate. That is unapprovable to God, Romans chapter 1. So if we have His Spirit, God's Spirit, then we belong to God, and God will, because of our attachment to Him, we talked about the vine, you remember that? Galatians 5. And then in John chapter 15, He is the, He's the vine, we're the branches, okay? He that remaineth in Him, abideth in Him, He will bear much fruit, but he that bears no fruit, God cuts them all, bundles them up, burns them but the man that lives for christ will bear much fruit uh, the reason is because he's attached to the one that did it to begin with the fruit of, of of the spirit is the fruit of jesus christ coming into the man which changes him from what he used to be into this new creature which is after the image of christ again see going back to the very beginning the restoration and reconciliation of mankind through what Jesus did. All right, let's go on. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. How many of you say praise you, God, every time you go through difficulties because you're a Christian? Most people don't want to do that, but you need to because, see, you are then bearing the stripes of Jesus. There you are like him. When you tell them what God says and they reject you because they love their sin and they prefer to stay in darkness, when you do that and then they start jumping on your case, let me say, you're in that little minuscule crowd of people that God approved of. Isn't it amazing that God himself sent his son who said, that there will be many people find that wide path and few there be that find that narrow path, few there be that find it. So all these people that go to church are going to heaven, right? Because they believe some doctrine and they have an intellectual pursuit of God, but they do not live for Him and they don't spend any time with Him. How do you have a relationship with God and not spend time with Him? Would that work with your husband or wife? Well, I talk to her once a week on Sunday. Friend, I'm telling you the truth. There's a frying pan with your name on it. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I mean. <laughs> I tell you, kind of winced when I said it. Anyway, <laughs> he says, and For when you're reproached for the name of Christ, happier you. For the Spirit of glory, that's God, and of God rest upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So when they're telling you, you know, you're wrong, you're false prophet, you're this, that, and the other, listen to me. When you're sticking with what God said and you're spending time in His presence, His Spirit's speaking to you all the time, and those people giving you a heartache because you still, you believe, you really believe. No, oh, you've gotten to be, uh, you know, so heavenly minded, you know earthly good. You hear all that junk. What verse is that in the Bible, though? Who are you listening to, the crowd? Isn't that the bunch that got drowned in Noah's day? Hmm. In Moses' day, isn't that the same bunch that the earth opened up and swallowed? Mm. <laughs> There's a day coming where, you know, he's going to destroy the earth again. Did you know that? He's going to take his people out, and then he's going to uh, burn up stuff. All corruptible things will be taken care of. He knows how to take care of problems, right? Uh, if you got a problem child, you know what that is? You know, a problem child. you got one that just doesn't want to do the right thing, won't tell you how to do everything. And they, You know, we live in an age where children want to tell the parent how to do stuff and have zero experience, but they still want to tell everybody. You know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, I'll tell you the truth. The Spirit of God comes on my hand every time I hear a child, you know, in a Piggly Wiggly or a Kroger wanting to talk back to the parent. I'm, my hand gets an anointing on it. 
<laughs> it's just by the grace of God that I haven't gone to jail for putting them in their place. You know what I mean? Anyway, he goes on to say, the spirit of God and of glory, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's evil spoken of, but on your part, he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. By the way, don't you hate those gossip programs on TV? For heaven's sake, I used to stay up late and watch some of those things until they started putting gossip programs on, and I just cut the TV off now. I'd rather go sing and praise the Lord and go read my Bible or, or do something, but I am not interested in sitting around listening to a bunch of big mouth women wanting to talk about somebody else like they had never sinned. Or some stupid man talking about men like he, he thinks that he's all of that. No, you better look inside, friend. The days are closing out, and unless you get this, uh, you're going to be like those people in the days of Noah. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. If you are persecuted for Christ's sake, then God is glorified on this behalf. When men give you a hard time because you're standing on the Word of God. Well, you know, that isn't what my preacher preaches. Better find a preacher that preaches the Word of God. God's going to prosper me, but it's in spiritual things. Did you know that? He'll give me everything that I have need of as long as I understand that everything that He gives to me is to be used for His purpose. But in the process of all of that, you see, we've got a whole different stage out there where people are saying, well, God wants to make all of you have a millionaire faith and you can't handle $20. Somebody is not telling the truth, right? And why is it? Let me say this to you. When I was a little boy, we'd go to church, and, you know, our Wednesday night service would start somewhere about 6 o'clock in the evening. And then we would start praying. They didn't. They didn't preach. And they would go down, and we'd all go down to the altar, and we would pray. I do remember falling asleep a few times. I have to be honest with you. I'd fall asleep, my head on that old hardwood altar that they had. It didn't have pads on it back then, you know. And and uh, I would sit there, and then I wake back up, and oh God, I'm sorry, you know. I I'm sorry, I fell asleep on you. <laughs> And that kind of stuff. But uh, the truth is, is that we would spend all night praying. It'd be three or four o'clock in the morning. Now, you know, the next day I wasn't fit for anything going to school. But something down in my heart felt different because I spent that time with the Lord. So it wasn't somebody's Sunday morning competition. You know, who can scream the loudest? You see, it was different. Because, you see, when people began to praise him, when he began to show up and, and, and lives were changed. And I want to tell you this. All you pastors out there trying to bring the world into the church, let me say something to you. Listen to me now. You see, the church is not for the world. It is for those who have followed his word and have become disciples have laid down their life. That's what baptism's about. I know you've forgotten that. That's one of the cardinal doctrines. But you see, when you lay down your life, you no longer had one. He had to give you a life then. And then you learned everything that you got from him. But when he would show up, I want to tell you this, we saw, then in my day, we saw people that would come in because they would pr were praying people. We would see people that would come in and in the beginning, it would be a small group, and then the word would get out because those people were unashamed to tell somebody about Jesus. And they would go out in the neighborhood and say, we're having a revival over at the church. And it was not just getting another man to come in and preach on a, on a day that the preacher didn't want to preach, you see. It was a revival where the Spirit of God came into the midst of those people. People were saved. People were healed. People were delivered from, from all kinds of bondage. And it was because Jesus showed up. And some of you need to get back down on that altar. And some of you in church need to remember this too. 
Now, you don't have to scream at me, Brother Ron. I'm not screaming at you. I am getting your attention because you fell asleep about 30 minutes ago. Listen. Second Thessalonians, the last one of these that we're going to look at. That the name of, of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in whom? You and you. And ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We can glorify God in our own lives or we can bring shame to the cause of Christ by the ungodly way in which we live. Is that right? Anybody in this room ever brought shame on the Lord? Yeah. How'd that feel? Not good at all. Well, how can I have what he wants me to have? Since God is the end of all things. He's the Alpha, the beginning, and the Omega, the end of all things. And unless you're in the Alpha and Omega, there's an end of you. There's a time where you will no longer be able to call on His name, and there's a time where you will find yourself separated from life. You will be in eternal death darkness. The Bible talks about that. Now I know that's not popular these days because they don't want to believe that, that God would al allow people to go to a place that He does not send anybody. You understand that. He does not send anybody to that place. The human sends himself by the rejection of what God has laid down as the way of life. God's ways are perfect. They don't have to change. God has never had to repent even though the writers in the Bible, some of them use the word repent, but that is not the original historical meaning from Hebrew. You know, that God already had in his mind what he was going to do ahead of time so that those people were made afraid so that they would repent. All of us in this room know what that is because God will let you go so far until the choker on your neck will pull you back and he will show you exactly where you were headed. You ever had that dark night of the soul? And God show you how terrible, how awful your sins are before Him? And then you're sitting there, and the only thing you can do is, God, have mercy. Have mercy on me, Lord. Please have mercy. Do you remember crying out anything like that? I can't save myself, Lord. I've tried a million times, but I can't save myself. God, save me. Have mercy on my soul. And until you start praying prayers like that, you can't be saved. You see, you think that you can save yourself. There is no religion in the world going to save you. And no preacher can save you. The Word of God being preached is foolishness to them. That You know, and there are people that, that hear it, and it's just foolishness. The Bible says, but it has the power of God unto salvation to them that believe it. You understand the difference? You can hear the Word of God, all, but if you're not a believer, see, how do you know you're a believer? Because you become a doer of the word, not a forgetful hearer. Amen? Amen? All right. Now we can go to our PowerPoint. I'm gonna, I'll, I am going to cut this short. I'll, I'll get two and three in, and we'll, we'll stop and we'll pick up there next week. But listen, I want you to hear this, that when we start looking into the fruit that is produced by uh, dependence on the vine, do you understand clinging to something? You know, the first time I ever realized what this was, I was in one of those old Ivy League schools where they had ivy crawling up on the bricks and, the, and that stuff. Do you know that the ivy was actually, there was no kind of, there's nothing in cement to bring fruit or to keep things alive. But see, then I realized that it was just hanging on to the hard stuff but it was gaining its its nourishment from the ground. As long as it could get that nourishment, it could cling on to that, uh, that rock-like substance. Well, some of these were actually rock, and they had cement in between the rocks and stuff like that. So, And it would just cling to that rock. You couldn't separate it. Have you ever tried to tear stuff like that off? Oh, my. Now that, I'm telling you the truth. Even if you're in good shape, by the end of the day, you are worn out because it has a strong hope. I mean, it, it has a, a connection to it that is very difficult to get all that stuff off. 
That's what he's trying to picture here for you. When you get a hold of the rock and you cling to him, he's going to feed you from the ground up. But he is, he, he is going to make you imperviable and they're impervious to the to the weather, to the situations that come along. You're going to be on the, I mean, those things have been there for hundreds of years in some of those schools. Just hundreds of years hanging on to that rock. Can you imagine that the leaves didn't fall off of that stuff? That it just hung there and, and, and it didn't matter what time of the year you went by? That stuff was always green. Always green. It never, its leaf didn't falter. It didn't change. This sounds like something David might have said in Psalms, doesn't it? Anyway, let's go on. The fruit that's produced by dependence on the vine. As you trust God personally in these areas to reveal uh, what He reveals to you, you have to trust Him. When I go to the Bible and I read what He says in John 15, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. What do you say to those people that didn't abide, didn't cling to him? They would be cut off. So he wants something to be developed inside of you. Here is what it is, sir. What happens when you cling to Him is, is that He imparts His very nature to you. His very character. When we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about the character and nature of God. If you don't know Him, go read what He says about Himself. There's no law against that being in you. If you have Him in you, this is what you'll bear. And because of that, the law has no power over you. But the fruit of the Spirit must be born in you through this abiding relationship, and without that abiding in Him, this isn't abiding in church. This isn't, oh, look, I love church, and I love church family, and that kind of stuff, but I want to tell you something. Unless you're abiding in Him, you can go to church all day long. Like my daddy used to say, just because that cat has kittens in an oven don't make them biscuits. You know, you can't continue to live that worldly life and have the fruit of the Spirit in you. You have to be changed from that old nature into this new man, which is like Christ Jesus. So what is it that He's placing inside of you is the very Spirit of Christ so that you can now bear the very fruit that He bore. So people look at you and they can see the love of Christ in you. They can see that joy. They can see that things don't get you down like it does them. I've had them say that to me a lot of times. How is you be going through all this stuff and they'll still be smiling? You know what I'm talking about, right? Because the fruit of the Spirit's in it. Look, my life is, is not consistent on the things going on around me. It's consistent on whom I, I'm attached to. Okay. I got to get out of here. Y'all won't be able to. I mean, y'all can't tolerate this stuff. <laughs> you will mature as you cling to the vine. People talk about spiritual maturity. Darling, let me say something to you. I see people all the time want to pretend that they're, they're mature. And, and I don't know where they get their stuff from because some of the stuff I'm going pretty deep stuff. You know, you find in a cow pasture. It's not, it's not God. It's somebody wanting to be spiritual, but they're not wanting to pay the price that is necessary to have that relationship and spend that time with God. I spend time with Him every day. You should too. I pray and I talk to Him all through the day. When I hear somebody talk to me, I want to know what He has to say. I don't want to give them a pat answer. I want to give them a God answer. What's the difference? A lot. I can give them my opinion. It's just like your opinion. I don't want to hear your opinion. What is your opinion? If it didn't come from God, it ain't nothing I need. 
God tells us what we need. We need Him. That's why He's telling you, cling to me. You'll bear much fruit when you cling to me. Yes, I'll allow difficulties to come in your life. That's to purge you so that you will bear even more fruit. It's the very picture he's painted here, that when I purge you, you're going to have more of my character than you ever thought you possibly could. You can't, I mean, you could spend all your life in a church building somewhere and never be attached to Christ and never gain any of this fruit that we're talking about. Because it's God in you. Y'all have read with me. I've shown you in John 14. When we obey Him, we're in Him, and He's in us. He comes and makes His abode in us. And then He tells us we will come and make our abode, meaning the whole of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will come make their abode in you. The fullness of God comes to dwell in you when you cling to Him with everything that you are. You know, people say, well, I don't have to obey, or God will understand. Listen to me, you dumb, dumb person. You say, God understands, but you, sir, are trying to dictate to Almighty God what He does. He takes no counsel from, from men, none. Have you read in His Word? You say, God Himself is telling you, listen, this is what I require of you. I could read it to you right out of the Scripture. But I want you to get it. I don't want to spoon feed everybody. I want you to be hungry enough to go and find the food for yourself. When you're hungry, isn't that what you do? You search out food. Mm. If you're hungry and thirst for righteousness, he said, he will fill you up. You will not thirst for the things of the world you will thirst for the things of God and when you have it God changes your character your very nature becomes different people might not like you because they're the world you see they didn't know him and they won't know you because see you're not of the world anymore when you're born again because he comes to dwell in you he's made you a citizen of a different culture a different kingdom not this one it's important for you to understand what God's doing in this time period. He's, he is absolutely drawing His church in. And He's drawing them away from worldliness and humanism. And, you know, well, I, I want to have fun every once in a while. I mean, you don't understand how damning that is. It's like the alcoholic that says, well, I'm only going to have one drink <laughs> till that drink begins to consume. Or the drug addict that says, well, well, one more time won't hurt. Oh, no, it will. It will kill you. You know, or the person who, who's engaged in any kind of addiction. Those things take over. See, when you yield to that, that worldliness, you become a slave to it. <coughs> Excuse me. It takes over. God wants you to yield to Him, become a slave to righteousness. The Bible says, put away those old things, become this new man. The end result of this is going to be so far beyond anything that you've ever thought about. God will show you things you don't know about the time which is to come. And what He's going to do in that time period, I promise you, is going to be, oh, it's so far beyond all of this stuff. that I mean, people down here, oh, wouldn't it be nice to look at Jesus face to face? Did you know something in the Bible, it says in John 14, that he will show himself to people that are, are obeying him, but he won't do that to other people? It won't be the first time you've ever seen him face to face. Everybody that's saying, that, I don't believe Jesus is going to show up. Well, you haven't seen him and that kind of thing, and no man's ever seen God. Um uh, you didn't read John 14, did you? You see, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then one of those Larry Moe and Curly guys came up and said, hey, if you show us the Father, then it will satisfy us. He said, how long must I be with you? These are the disciples, by the way, smart boys, aren't they? Tell them something they couldn't even remember it two seconds after he told it to them. Because things have to be spiritually discerned. The Bible itself 
has to be spiritually discerned. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And until a person understands that, they go and read the Bible, and they don't remember what they read. But you see, when they go to him and they pray and say, Lord, reveal yourself to me, and they start reading, then the Holy Spirit takes over, and that page is not just a page anymore. He shows you something of the character and the nature of God. And when you see it, you know that you aren't that. And then you beg. See, that's that hungering and thirsting for right standing with God. And then you beg for him to make you like that. Well, I know this isn't pablum on Sunday morning. I wanted you to get something you would not probably get in a lot of places. But I wanted you today to hear that God wants to bear fruit, much fruit through you. And he can when you obey him and submit your life to him and you spend that time talking to him. Look, if I ask you to pray, I don't want you to say, Lord, bless Brother Ron. My God. You see, that is not prayer. You see, that is laziness that does not know that you've got to get into the presence of the Father to ask Him to have His way with someone. When you ask me to pray, I'm not going, no, oh, you know, bless and, and heal, you know. and that, No, what I'm asking is, Lord, have your way. I have people all the time, missionaries, all of you missionaries, listen to Brother Ron right now. You say, don't call me and beg me for money. You see, you are looking way too low. He told you that he would meet all of your needs, your needs, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You see, if he uses men, it will be because he called them to do it, not because you did. I've been doing this 47 years. To this day, I have never begged anybody for anything. I ask God to meet my needs. And I ask him to meet yours. But it's God that has to meet it. Otherwise, it's an illegitimate way of getting your needs met. God promised. And if you don't believe his promises, you can't have what he's promising. Amen? God puts it in the heart of man. Remember what we said. It's God in a man that wills. And until a man begins to hear him, there's no will of God being performed in him. It's the will of a man in his name. And by the way, when you can't spend time with him, do you know that's the spirit of the Antichrist? Anything but Christ. I can spend all my time. Wait a minute. Doesn't God deserve the glory of having his... Because the Bible tells us that his people are his glory and doesn't he deserve his people and shouldn't we be the ones that are actually submitted to him so that he can have what he created for himself for his namesake for his glory see he's the end not a means to an end and it isn't that he won't let you have stuff he will but he won't let stuff have you I could preach another hour on that one just by itself. Okay. <laughs> Underline, we're on foot. Okay. <laughs> God's ongoing work will spill over into you when you're clinging to Him. God in you, the hope of glory. Amen? All right, Father, you put those things in my heart. And I've spoken those things out loud. I've declared them before your people and before people around the world and every nation. So, Father, I'm asking you, Lord God, to receive glory. This is not a man that a man should boast. This is of you, that you might get the glory and the praise. Even when men do things, you said it in the Word of God, that when we do things, men ought to see that what we're doing, and then they ought to turn around and give glory to God for what they see. Father, we give glory to you today for all you're doing in your people and around the world. I ask you for a great revival like we've never seen. I ask you for a great gathering and in, uh, income of souls into the kingdom of God before it's too late. And, Father, you know the day, you know the hour, only you. And, Heavenly Father, today we're just asking you 
those things which you've promised in your word, that there would be a great ingathering toward the end. Heavenly Father, I know there has been a great falling away to this point, but I know that there's a great revival coming just before you return. Heavenly Father, let it start now in Jesus' name. Let your name be glorified above every name that's named and help every heart, Lord God, to be subject to you and submitted to you under the hearing of your word and the anointing of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.